Good evening and welcome to the St. Louis Four School Virtual College Fair powered by StriveScan. We're so excited that you've decided to join us tonight to learn about these six fantastic colleges and universities. Since this is a webinar, your camera and your microphone are off, so our presenters cannot see you nor can they hear you, but they would love to hear from you. So if you do have questions for any of the schools tonight, please feel free to type those questions into the Q&A box at any time. You don't have to wait for a particular school's presentation. The format tonight is what we call a six by six. There are six schools who will get six minutes to present each. If you'd like to sign up for more sessions, I would love for you to do that. But unfortunately, this is the last session tonight, so you can't. But thankfully, we've recorded everything tonight. So if there are schools that you missed, or if you want to go back and review any of the presentations from any of the schools, you can easily do that by going to strivescan.com backslash St. Louis for school. You'll see that there on the screen. So that is my housekeeping. That's what I have to share with you. So let's get started with our true presentations. Our first presenter is from Haverford College. Hi, everyone. Just going to share my screen real quick. Oh, I have to wait a second. So my name is Tyler Clausen Wolf. I am an admission counselor from Haverford College. Uh, we are a liberal arts institution. Uh, we have just over 1300 students. Uh, the lush green campus that we have, you can actually see it behind me, um, is actually a nationally recognized arboretum. And you can see that there's a duck pond, there's a nature trail. It's certainly one of the things that I miss most um, working from home is not being able to actually be physically on our really beautiful and amazing campus where so much activity and, and just a hub of stuff takes place. Um, outside. Um, you can kind of see that even uh, we have this defined layout and there's a kind of clearly defined campus, never unsure if you're on campus or you're off. 60% uh, um, of our faculty actually live on campus, so you develop very close relationships with them. Uh, but you also have the advantage of being 20 minutes uh, from the heart of Center City, Philadelphia. It's about a 20 minute train ride. There's train lines on either side of campus. Um, and then there's also, it's about a 25 minute drive if you happen to, to bring your car as well. Um, and then everything that Philadelphia has to offer is really at the fingertips of, for you as a student, whether that's going to a sporting event, going to a concert, there's actually a very simple process where if what you're doing is academically or culturally enriching, you can actually get the train tickets for free from the administration. And I know students that have actually just used this to go downtown and get a bite to eat at a restaurant. So Philadelphia is really there um, for the use um, of the students. Uh, and even though we're also, so we're close to Philadelphia, but you also have the opportunity for a larger social and academic network through the Tri-College uh, Consortium and through our Quaker Consortium. Uh, in fact, Bryn Mawr is, is on this presentation as well. So you'll hear from there in a minute, but um, really it just allows students to, as you see in the middle, just have more academic opportunities uh, you can also swipe into the other dining centers. Our relationship with Bryn Mawr is extremely close. You can actually major or minor in anything that they offer and then they can do the same um, at Haverford. So the three pillars of the school that the Haverford community live by are trust, uh, concern, and respect. And we believe um, that really we value the student voice um, as much as, as anywhere uh, and student agency. Uh, in terms of what students are able to do in, on our campus. So this is exemplified in take-home tests, in proctorless exams, and also self-scheduled finals week. So it really allows students to take ownership over their academic experience and also their, their social experience um, in ways that is best for them uh, as an individual to reach that full academic potential. And our student body actually has a meeting every semester where they re-ratify our honor code. Um, it's a completely student written uh, 10 page document. So it's not just like a list of uh, 10 things that's very prescriptive. It is, it's changing as the student body changes, it changes as the world changes um, and it changes as Haverford changes, even as we still stay true to those pillars uh, that I mentioned um, earlier. And so this 10 page document encompasses all of academic and social life on campus. And again, it is 100% written by the students. So 
here you see here a, a plenary meeting, a, a picture of it, uh, where we require two thirds uh, of the student body to show up in order to enact any changes. So students take this very seriously uh, because of the ownership that, that it gives them. Uh, we want to make Haverford affordable, so we meet 100% of demonstrated need of all accepted students. So this is regardless of what round um, a student applies uh, in. It also is regardless of citizenship status, so that's really our commitment to make Haverford affordable. And then we have a really uh, strict loan policy where if a uh, family makes under $60,000 a year, we have a no loan policy. And if they make over that, it's tiered up where the maximum amount of loans uh, that a, a student will receive in their financial aid package while still uh, meeting 100% of this demonstrated need is uh, $3,000 a year. So we really wanna limit that. And then there's even a process through which you can apply uh, to have Haverford pay off your loans after you graduate uh, from Haverford. Uh, so we look for students who are passionate and intellectually curious. So this is one such example that is also unique to Haverford, where every single graduating senior, uh, regardless of major or GPA, gets to write their own senior thesis. So every single student gets to produce their own original piece of scholarly academic work that they um, uh, get to propose and get to do all the research and, and all of that work themselves. They really, once again, have ownership over this and the ability to um, pick something that's important to them or, or interesting to them and really dive in deep if, with, uh, on that for their senior thesis. And students have this love of learning fostered on our campus and they can take those skills uh, to be ethical leaders uh, in the world just beyond the four years that they have at Haverford. And then of course, uh, feel free to stay in touch with uh, me, in touch with our office. If you wanna learn more, we have all of these amazing events that you can do and participate in because obviously six minutes is just scratching the surface for all of the institutions that are on this call. So if, if you wanna learn more, um, ask the questions and get in touch with us because we, we have the answers. So um, I'm Tyler from Haverford and thank you all so much for, for being here. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is from Ursinus College. All right, good evening, everybody. Just give me one moment and I will share my screen. All right, so good evening, everybody. My name is Douglas Ulrich. I'm one of the senior assistant directors of Ursinus College. You'll see right there, we get asked a lot of how to pronounce the name. So there it is right there. Once again, that is Ursinus College. So Ursinus College is located about 25 miles from Philadelphia, not too far from some of the schools that are here, not too far from Haverford that just prevent it. So we're about 25 miles from Philadelphia, depending on traffic, that's anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour. We are a smaller liberal arts institution than a top 100 nationally ranked liberal arts institution as ranked by US News and Reports in the country. We have about 1500, 1500 undergraduate students. 10 to one is the student to faculty ratio and 15 is the average class size. We do sit on 170 acres of absolutely beautiful open land that has a lot of architecture that has been reinvested onto the campus over the last two and a half years. We are also one of 44 colleges that change lives. And to quickly jump into that, basically what the Colleges That Change Lives organization is, is an organization that went around in the early 2000s that identified different colleges around the country that offered a transformative education. Obviously, there's some really big name, marquee name schools that are out there that we think this is the school that we need to go to in order to have that career that I want. Well, there are also a lot of other colleges that are out there that offer that same type of education, if not a better one that is more suited for you. So back in the early 2000s, we were first deemed as a CTCL school, and we have been in every single edition of that since the early 2000s. Moving right along, though we are a smaller institution, we are certainly not a commuter college or a suitcase school. About 94% of our students do live on campus. We have 37 different residency options here, whether it is first year traditional housing, suite or apartment style complexes, or single Victorian style houses that are across the street from our main campus. Now we've mentioned that we're a CTCL school. We've mentioned that we're a top 100 liberal arts institution that goes along with our academic majors. So along with those great, uh, great accolades that we have, we are also a Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society school. So that's the nation's oldest and most revered honor society. Only about 10% of colleges and institutions across the country are able to have that distinction. So though you'll see right there in the middle that our top five majors are biology, applied economics slash business, health and exercise physiology, psych and media and communication studies, 
of all the majors and programs we offer, you are held to the same academic standard. So we do offer 60 plus areas of study. It's about 30 majors and 30 minors. And the beautiful, beautiful thing about a liberal arts institution, specifically here at Ursinus, is we know that you guys all have multiple passions and we want you to turn those passions into professions. So about 80% of our students will either double major or attach a minor to their major program of study. So again, we encourage you to explore every single thing that you wanna do. When you come to our sinus, you will come in with an academic interest and throughout your fall semester, your freshman year, you will be required to meet with your academic advisor once a week, every week throughout the entirety again of that fall semester to really discuss what you wanna do. Now we've talked about these accolades, we've talked about some great things that you can do, but what about the affordability factor? Of course, that's a key part of selecting a college that you wanna to go to. So 99% of our students will receive some sort of financial aid and every single admitted student will receive a merit-based scholarship that ranges between $21,000 to $40,000. Now we know that a lot of you guys out there are doing some pretty amazing things already. So we have 13 affinity-based specialty scholarships that could range from volunteerism, community service, leadership, social justice, things of that nature that range between $5,000 to $10,000, which can be stacked on top of your merit-based aid. So we do try to make things as affordable as we possibly can. Now, we talked about how every student technically comes in with an academic interest, and then you decipher what you want to do after that. Well, how do we make that happen? We have a very dialogue-based education system here at Ursinus, and it's called the Ursinus Quest or the CIE, which stands for the Common Intellectual Experience. And we ask those four questions that you see down below, of what should matter to me, how should we live together, how can we understand the world, and what will I do? Some pretty broad questions, but again, we really want to reinforce this concept of having a dialogue-based discussion. Not everybody comes from the same background, not everybody has the same views and values, and that's how the real world works, because you have to come together to have these discussions to figure out common solutions to pretty complex problems. So we try to introduce that to you from the start of your freshman year. Now, moving right along, much like you guys are more than just transcripts and SAT scores, we are more than just a classroom. So there's so many different things that you can do here at our sinus. No pun intended or not, not to be coincidental as I wear the UC on my chest, but there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of student spirit, faculty and staff spirit on campus where a lot of students are rocking the UC or the bear on their chest. We do have 25 varsity NCAA Division III sports teams, and we do play in the Centennial Conference. So I like to say that we are very athletically and academically gifted. There's a lot of support for our students on and off the field, in and out of the classroom. Now, along with that, we have so many different clubs and organizations that you can participate in, whether it's Greek life, acapella groups, mock trial, outdoors club, community service, you name it, we pretty much have it. And again, the beauty of a smaller school is that it doesn't take much for you to start your own club. If there's a club that you want and we don't offer that, typically it only takes you and about eight other students to start that club. And what that leads to is a lot of students who are staying here on campus because they fall in love with the 170 acres that we have and everything that goes along with it. So we have an 87% retention rate, retention rate, which far exceeds the national average. Now I want to jump down below before we go to that job placement rate, but all of those things to kind of be, you know, cognizant of time here really lead to an amazing job placement rate. We talked about the academics, we talked about what you can do off campus, we talked about what you can do on campus. But what about putting all of that theory that you're learning in the classroom into practice? So we have a program here that's called the XLP or the Experiential Learning Project that requires students to have some sort of hands-on experience before they graduate. And they can do that in a multitude of ways, but all of that leads to that 95% placement rate within six months of graduation. So I'm going to drop a little box below. If you guys want some more information, you can fill out the link. But I do encourage you, if you are in the area, to come visit us. Thank you so much. Kind of sticking in the neighborhood, we're going to hear now from Bryn Mawr College. Hi, everyone. Sorry to, to start you off making you a little bit dizzy there, um, but my name is Jennifer Keegan. I'm an Associate Director of Admissions at Bryn Mawr College. Um, Bryn Mawr College is a women's college. We're located in uh, suburban Philadelphia. We have about 1,300 students. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit this evening about our academic program, um, some of our curricular innovations, um, student life, and then some next steps as well. So a little bit about um, the way that our approach is to inquiry. So at Bryn Mawr, we don't have like an English 101 um, or a Math 102. 
Instead, what we have are called our approaches to inquiry. And you can see the four of those um, topics there. And what they are is they allow you to take those classes both in your academic comfort zone um, and outside of your academic comfort zone. Because I think we all know those areas that we love um, and we feel really confident in, but we want you to take those risks and to try things um, that you maybe haven't had a chance to explore yet in high school. Um, but we also want you to graduate within four years. So you'll be working with an academic dean throughout your time um, at Bryn Mawr to make sure that you're getting these courses taken and then really narrowing in on a major or a minor um, in that junior year um, and senior year. You'll also take a course called our Emily Balsh seminar, um, and that is taken by all first year students. Um, and you'll also um, to have a quantitative reasoning course. Um, and we also want you to take a foreign language. We just think that's um, important to being liberally educated. So that's a bit of an overview um, of our academic program at Bryn Mawr. So I do want to talk a little bit about Bryn Mawr as a women's college. Um, and I know some students are really excited about that. Um, and some students are a little bit nervous. Um, you know, maybe you haven't had that experience. But I want to assure you that no matter where you fall, um, that our students, when they were sitting when we were sitting, maybe they weren't drawn to Bryn Mawr because it was a women's college. Maybe they were drawn because of our community or our rigorous academics. But once they're here, they're so glad that they chose Bryn Mawr um, because it is a women's college. And I do want to talk a little bit about why that might be. Um, and part of that is, is the success of our students in traditionally male-dominated fields. So we are um, graduating 2.5 times the national average um, of degrees awarded to women in STEM. Um, and you might be sitting here going, but Jennifer, my passions are in the fine arts and they're in the music. Why is that statistic important to me? And the reason that it's important is that there are some fields um, like business and politics that young women haven't always been encouraged to pursue in the same way um, that young men have. And we're changing that at Bryn Mawr. And so no matter what you're excited about, no matter what you're passionate about, uh, not only are you going to have the support of faculty and staff, um, who, but of your peers um, who may see things in you that you don't even yet see in yourself. And that network doesn't leave you. So it's something that you'll draw upon as a student at Bryn Mawr, um, but then also as well, once you graduate from the college, you're going to be joining some of the most powerful professional networks of women in the United States and around the world. The other thing, if many of you are interested in pursuing research, about 100% of our students will complete a senior thesis or a capstone project. So research and that really deep dive into subjects is something that many of our students will do. And 97% um, of our students will have a positive career outcome um, after they leave graduate, once they graduate from the college. And we'll talk a little bit in the next slide about how we make that happen. So uh, as you've gotten to see with some of my colleagues, um, a beautiful picture of Philadelphia. Um, we are located about 11 miles west of Philadelphia. So about a 20 minute train ride from the, the, from the downtown. Um, we are about two blocks from one train and about a mile from another train. Um, and so very easy to access the city. Um, we are in, as Tyler mentioned, an academic consortium with Haverford. Haverford is our most seamless relationship. So if you're interested, at all lie in the fine arts or in music, I encourage you to visit virtually visit them. We have dance, theater, and growth and structures of cities. Um, we're in the Tri-College Consortium with Swarthmore College, which is about 20 minutes um, by van. And then we're part of the Quaker Consortium that includes Haverford, Swarthmore, and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but with that being said, you could also spend four years at Bryn Mawr and have a completely comprehensive experience. So it doesn't speak to the lack on the part of any of our institutions, just these wonderful additional benefits. Benefits. Um, 77 uh, percent of our students will complete an in, at least one internship in their time, and we have over $750,000 available in funding for students. Um, so part of the way we're able to help students really become prepared for life after Bryn Mawr is to help have them have those experiences to figure out what they like and, and what they don't like so that they're in good stead um, once they leave the college. We have 20 to 
combined degree programs that allow students to earn both their bachelor's and their master's degree in that shorter amount of time. Um, and we have 90 study abroad programs that, of course, with COVID-19 this year um, looked a little different, but we're hoping um, to be um, able to do those again. Um, and if you go on a Bryn Mawr approved program, all your financial aid will travel with you and your credits do transfer back. So we do try to make that as seamless as possible for our students. So, um, so I do want to sort of talk a little bit as well about our student life. Um, we have over a hundred different clubs and organizations that will students will join um, for our sports. Um, our, we have, uh, you've heard the Centennial Conference and um, two of my competitors are here on this call tonight. Um, and so we compete in that as well. So um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know it's a challenging time to be looking at colleges, so hopefully we'll get a chance to virtually visit um, and see in person soon. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we'll hear from Seton Hall University. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Campbell. I'm one of the assistant directors of admission here at Seton Hall. We'll go ahead and just jump right in. So Seton Hall is a medium sized Catholic university located in South Orange, New Jersey, just a place that's in the state that's about 14 miles outside of New York City. We have about 6200 undergraduate students and close to 4000 grad students. We're split pretty evenly with 51% female and 49% male. All 50 states as well as 70 different countries are represented within our student body and we have about a 45% diversity rate. We really pride ourselves on personalized attention here at Seton Hall. Our average class size is just around 21 students. Our student to faculty ratio is 14 to one, and that does really allow our faculty to become great mentors for our students throughout their time at Seton Hall. We have over 90 different undergraduate programs for students to choose from, and they're split amongst a variety of colleges that we offer. Our largest is the College of Arts and Sciences. That's where you can find your traditional majors and minors in the humanities and the sciences. We also have some more specialized colleges, such as our School of Diplomacy and International Relations, our College of Nursing, excuse me, and our College of Education and Human Services, our College of Communication and the Arts as well. I did also list here some of our graduate schools, such as our Seton Hall Law School, as well as our School of Health and Medical Sciences, just because we do offer quite a few dual degree programs and accelerated programs um, with those grad schools. Regardless of what major or program you choose at Seton Hall, there's tons of opportunities for hands-on learning. You can do research with faculty and present that research at national conferences. You can study abroad or even spend a full semester in Washington, DC. There's plenty of opportunities to get involved in community service in our South Orange area. We also have great opportunities to get involved in WSOU, which is our college radio station, as well as the Suetonian, our college newspaper. In our Stillman School of Business, we have our Market Research Center, Mock Trading Room, and Sports Polling Center, which is great experience before you even touch an internship. We also have tons of learning labs, both on our main campus in South Orange, as well as on our Health Science Campus, which is located in Nutley, New Jersey, just about 10 miles from our main campus in South Orange. Again, we're really close to New York City, which is great for field trips that our professors will take our students on, various guest lectures that might be presenting and internships. Speaking of internships, currently in our database for our students, there's over 17,000 internship opportunities available to take advantage of. And we have a great career center that'll start working with you as early as your freshman year, um, whether it be building your resume, preparing for an interview, or just working through the application process. Over 80% of our students have at least one internship before they graduate, and I think that's why we have such a high employment rate of 93% six months after graduation. Tons of employers do recruit directly from our student body, and you can see some of the top employers listed here on this slide. Certainly a lot within finance, media, a lot of different government positions and healthcare positions as well. Switching gears a little bit to talk about campus life. So when it comes to student life, there's over 150 different student clubs and organizations to get involved in. We also have Greek life um, that range from academic organizations to social Greek life to community service-based organizations. So there's definitely a lot to get involved in. On top of that, our student activities board does a great job of bringing a lot of entertainment to campus. So there's always something going on during the week and on the weekends. We're also a division one schools and we're part of the Big East Conference. Um, and there's 14 division one teams to take advantage of. Um, if you're not a D1 athlete, that's totally okay. We also have club and inter-real sports for our students to stay active on campus. 
When it comes to housing, we have six residence halls and two apartment buildings on campus. About 80% of our freshmen will live on campus and overall about 50% of our students will live on campus. 50% will live off. Uh, many of the students living off campus are living right within downtown South Orange within walking distance of campus. So it is really an extension of our campus in that way. When it comes to scholarships and financial aid, we give over $100 million in grants and scholarships every year. 98% of our students are receiving some form of aid, whether that's a grant or a scholarship directly from Seton Hall. When it comes to merit scholarships, these are automatically awarded to you if you're admitted to Seton Hall. On top of that, we do have some special scholarships that require an additional application, and the deadline every year is around January 15th, and you can apply right on our website. Lastly, I'll touch on the application process. We have two early action deadlines of November 15th and December 15th. Early action is a great way to show your interest in Seton Hall, but it's not binding. And then we also have two regular decision deadlines of February 1st and March 1st. If you need a little bit more time to work on your application, we are on the Common App. And then we also have our own Seton Hall application. Doesn't matter to us which one you submit. We're happy to accept either of those. We'll of course also need your personal essay, high school transcript and council report, one teacher letter of recommendation. And then we are gonna be test optional for fall 2022. But of course, if you get the chance to take the SAT or ACT, um, we highly recommend submitting those as well if you get the chance. Overall, we are using a holistic review when looking at your application. So we're taking into account all the different pieces of your application that you've submitted to us. But just some averages to keep in mind, students typically come in with an average GPA of a 3.6, an average SAT of a 1235 or an average ACT of a 27. Of course, these are just averages, so students come in below and above those um, as well. That's all I have for you guys tonight. I will go ahead and include some contact information in the chat, as well as some information if you're interested in visiting campus. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is from the George Washington University. All righty. Party started. So my name is Joshua Lowe. Um, let's see, Joshua Lowe, I'm from the George Washington University, RG Dub. So we'll start off of where we're located. So we're located right in the heart of Washington, DC, or the district as we call it. And we have a kind of contained campus. So a lot of people think we are spread out like many metropolitan campuses. We are not. We are a little bit. We are right there in the heart of DC. We're close to the IMF World Bank, blocks from the White House, blocks from you know, Congress. And this is very important because our students are able to do internships and research opportunities throughout the district, Northern Virginia, as well as Maryland, and a lot of different federal departments, but also with um, different NGOs and different companies based in the district um, in the surrounding area. Now we do have two campuses, so we are a little bit unique. So the one I highlighted is Foggy Bottom or what we call Foggy. Um, it has the Metro stop right there. So it's quick access to everything in the district. But we then have Mount Vernon, which is about two miles Northwest. Um, and it is a more traditional campus. So it is 25 rolling acres in Northwest DC. About a third of our first year students will live there. Um, but all of our first year students will take at least one class on that campus. And there is a shuttle that goes back and forth that we call the VEX, so that you're able to jump on that and go to the Vern um, and take your class and come back. If you live on the Vern, you can schedule all your classes either on the Vern or the Foggy. You can still jump on that VEX and go back and forth multiple times a day. Now, dining at GW is a bit different than a lot of other institutions. So we have a dining hall, but is not really the big dining hall that everyone imagines. Um, our dining is more of partners. So you'll have money loaded onto your G World or um, G World ID, and you're able to go to any of our over five, um, 105 different dining partners. So that our food goes our food trucks, restaurants, grocery stores, delis, coffee shops. They're located throughout Foggy as well as throughout the district. And I believe there are some um, outside of the district as well. And then this year we did partner with Grubhub. So I believe that partnership will continue. So you're able to order food and have it delivered to your residence hall. 
Now, student life, like many institutions, we have lots of stuff for you to be able to do. We have over 500 clubs and organizations. So we have Greek life, um, academic Greek, um, academic unit, special interest, political, you name it, we have it. If we don't have it on campus, you can definitely bring that onto campus as well. But when I say we have a little bit of everything, I believe we now have three K-pop dance crews on campus. So when I say a little bit of everything, I truly mean it. Now we do have our sports. So we have our division one sports, as well as our club sports and intramural sports. So we have a lot of different levels for our students to be able to be involved in our cheer on, um, as well as we do have those national teams um, throughout the district. So you can always go catch one of those games, one of our games, our club or intramural game as well. Now here are a list of all of our different colleges and schools. And we have about 70 different 75 different majors that are offered. I um, mean, a lot of our students will either double major or major minor, and you can do so both within and across different major um, schools and colleges. We do have two unique schools that are actually sub schools within our Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. So that one, it, those are our Corcoran School of Arts and Design and our School of Media and Public Affairs. So those are technically schools within Columbian, but we treat as independent. So you'll actually get two academic advisors for those. So you have one in Columbian and one within that other school. We have our Elliott School of International Affairs. Um, and with Elliott, it actually is just across the street from the State Department. So we have visiting faculty um, straight from the State Department who walk across, teach our students and are able to go back um, and finish out their day at the State Department. And our students are also able to do a lot of different internships with the State Department and a lot of the different embassies within the district as well. We then have Milken Institute of Public Health, our School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and our School of Business. Now here are some special programs that you may wanna consider. Um, so we do have some living learning communities so for us, we do require our students to live on campus for three years. The first year you can live in a living learning community. Um, those are typically within the Mount Vernon Campus Scholars, um, Civic House, our Women's um, Politics and Values and Women's Leadership Program. And those are all communities where you are pretty much applying um, in our group together with similar interests and taking classes together. So Civic House is around community service, Women's leadership has about five different cohorts, um, business, science, international affairs, arts and culture. And I can't remember the last one off the top of my head. Politics and values, obviously around politics. And then Mount Vernon Campus Scholars has focused on globalization and sustainability. We also have a BAMD, which is a highly, a highly competitive program if you want to fast track to go into med school. So you'll do um, your BA in three years, and then you'll go and be automatically accepted into our med school program. And then we also have our honors program. We are on the Common App, so you will apply that way. It's the only way to apply. We are an ED school, so ED1, ED2, and regular decision. The ED decisions are binding. So if that is something you want to do, you're pretty much saying, if accepted, you're coming hands down. But if that's not really what you want to do, completely fine. We still take most of our students via the regular decision. Um, and for anyone going into BAMD, it does have a different deadline of November 15th. Now that is pretty much GW in a nutshell. And I'll drop my contact information in the chat. Thank you so much, Joshua. And our last, but certainly not our least presenter tonight is from Johns Hopkins University. All right, thank you so much. Um, can I get a quick confirmation? You can see my PowerPoint. I've been having some sure tech can. issues. Okay, You're wonderful. All good. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here with all of you tonight. My name is Kylie Dowling. I'm an Associate Director of Admissions at Johns Hopkins University, um, and I'm your Regional Representative for Johns Hopkins. So I'm especially excited to be here with all of you uh, tonight. So let's jump right in. First and foremost, where are we located? So Johns Hopkins University is located in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so very close to a lot of my colleagues on this call. 
Um, we are about 45 minutes to an hour away from Washington, DC, about an hour and a half from Philadelphia and about three hours south of New York City. So very centrally located there on the East Coast. Um, and in this really quick presentation, we're gonna be focusing on the undergraduate campus. So that is on the right side of the screen, our Homewood campus. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, our size and the context of being a mid-sized undergrad population within the context of a large research university. Um, but Johns Hopkins was founded as the first research university in the United States back in 1876. So it is something that has always been really important to the institution. That being said, we are also founded uh, with the liberal arts philosophy at the same time. So we do really value a liberal arts education um, that is completely entwined in our um, curriculum, what courses students are taking. We do have a very flexible curriculum. So that leads to a lot of double majoring and, minor and minoring. Um, in all, I believe we have over 60% of our students double majoring and minoring. And a lot of them are completely mixing and matching their academics. Uh, one of my all time favorite student workers was electrical engineering and romance languages as a double major. So very unique, uh, but you'll find a lot of our students doing, uh, doing that. And like I mentioned, research and hands-on learning is really core to who we are as an institution. Um, and about 98% of our students will participate in some kind of pre-professional experience before they graduate. That typically comes in the form of research and internships. Uh, but these are students across every single academic area. So students in the natural sciences are doing as much research as students who are studying engineering or humanities and social sciences. And we are actually very split evenly across academic disciplines. We are about one third engineers, one third natural sciences, one third humanities and social sciences. I mentioned our size is a little bit unique. So we are fortunate that we have a mid-sized undergraduate population of about 5,400 students, but we're in the context of a really large research university. So you can see on the screen, all of the different arms and branches that we have at Johns Hopkins. Um, so with that comes amazing opportunities. You get the funding. Um, we've been the top funded research university in the US for almost 40 years in a row. We have over hundred startups that are supported by Hopkins Tech Ventures. Um, so you get a lot of those opportunities, but you're also getting that feeling of the so small school support with 5,400 undergraduate students. Um, so I think the, the balance of our size is um, definitely an advantage. On campus, we have over 400 student-run groups. So there is a lot going on at any given time. Um, and I think our, our campus is really great too because it's a nice, size. It's a pretty large campus of green grass and trees and rainbows and butterflies all the time. It's beautiful. Um, you can't drive through campus. It's very much a traditional college campus, uh, but we're also in the city of Baltimore. So if students are looking for more of a campus environment, but also access to a city, then we could be a good match in terms of what we can offer. Um, for the city of Baltimore, so we are about 10 minutes north of the main downtown area. So the picture there on the bottom, the Inner Harbor. Um, so we're very close to where everything is happening. Um, and the city of Baltimore is pretty unique in that it's made up of over 200 different and unique neighborhoods. So it's fun walking around. In five minutes, you could discover a new neighborhood with a unique food culture and unique vibe. Um, there's a lot going on. And for those of you who are interested in also having access to parks and trails. We actually have over 200 parks in the city of Baltimore um, with over 60 trails. So um, there's, it's still possible to be a part of nature even when you're in the city. And one thing that sets us apart a little bit and is a little bit unique is our life design lab. A few years ago, we actually got rid of our traditional career center and replaced it with a life design lab. Um, and at the core of this, basically we are training students to um, look at experiences as a way to identify what excites them in their life and teaching them and coaching them on how to actually design the life that they want to live. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely reach out to me and I can connect you with the Life Design Lab to learn a little bit more. When it comes to applying to Hopkins, so we do have two early decision rounds. This is new for us this year. Um, our early decision two deadline is a little bit later, but it's still that binding agreement. 
Um, so we've already mentioned that in one of the presentations that if you apply early decision, you're indicating it's your top choice school and you are bound to come if you're admitted. So please keep that in mind if you're interested in applying early decision to any of our schools. Um, we do guarantee to meet 100% of demonstrated need for all admitted students. Um, so we do have a really strong commitment to make this an affordable option for all students who are applying and admitted. And that is pretty much it for me. I'll drop my contact information in the chat. So absolutely feel free to reach out. I know this was pretty quick, but hopefully it gives you a little bit of an overview of Johns Hopkins. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kylie. And thank you to all of our presenters for their great information and their introductions to their institutions. At this point, I would love to have everyone come back on camera and as an added benefit for our students who are participating, I would love to hear your response to this question. What kind of advice would you give to a student who is embarking on their college search? And we'll go in the same order that we presented. So Tyler, you are up first. Thank you. There is, I mean, probably unlimited advice that we can give. Um, what, what I would give is um, that all the institutions on the, this call are amazing. There are so many amazing institutions in the entire country. So what you need to do is find out kind of what you're looking for in your college experience and what college can meet those desires and those needs. Um, and the way you do that is by doing a lot of research, talking to students, talking with alumni, talking with admission counselors. I mean, it's in our job title, we are counselors. Uh, we are here to help you through this process and teach you about our institutions. Um, and it's definitely in, to your benefit to um, email us. I know that's like super awkward and you think maybe we're super busy and don't have time for that, but that is in our job title. It's what we're here for. That's probably the thing that I enjoy most is connecting with prospective students. Um, so ask those questions, figure out what it is that you're looking for so that you can make an informed decision. Um, in your process, not only on where you apply, but then also where you ultimately attend. Douglas. Yeah, so I think Tyler, you hit it right, you know, now on the head on that one. Piggybacking off what you said, I think getting to know your counselor is crucial. As you guys can tell, probably it's a little bit more challenging through the webcam, but we're real people. You know, we have personalities, get to know us. That literally is our job, as Tyler said, to, to counsel you through this process. So taking it to the next step, it's been a little bit of a weird year and, and we understand that, but it's kind of worked out to the benefit for, for you guys out there to visit other schools that maybe you wouldn't get the chance to do, whether that's doing a virtual visit, a one-on-one -on -one visit, going to a high school visit that's through a computer screen. So if you have the chance to do that, I would highly recommend it. It gives you a really easy opportunity to do some research and I'll let somebody else take this because I know we, we all share similar views, but it gives you the chance to then physically get on campus and get a feel for all of those different schools. So connect with us, do the virtual things. That way you can kind of dive a little bit deeper into that research and really get a true feel for the foundation of the colleges that you're looking for. Jennifer. I, well, I think my advice would be is to start a notebook or a journal. Um, I think you you all are starting the search process at a really nice time um, in April. I can't believe it's already almost May, um, but uh, but the fall will be here before you know it, and you're going to be working on supplemental essays, and you want to be as specific as possible. And um, so begin taking notes. Once I know once you're off the call tonight, write down what did you think of the colleges that you saw? What were some of the things that stood out? Um, and then because as we've talked, this is a process. You're trying to find a match um, for a college that'll be a good fit for you. So, um, and the way to kind of do that is to kind of just keep notes and say, what did it feel like to virtually visit? What did it feel like when we're finally able to be back on our campuses when I visited there? And then when you, it's time to write those supplemental essays um, that might ask you to reflect on, you know, why did you choose to apply to our college? Um, you'll have the answer sort of right at your fingertips. So that would be my piece of advice. Sarah, what can you add? Yeah, I would add um, to push yourselves out of your comfort zone. I think college is a great opportunity to try something new. So whether that's um, looking at colleges that are a little bit farther from home, out of state, maybe a little bit bigger or smaller than you were originally planning or thinking about. Um, again, I think it's a great opportunity just to try something new um, and really put yourselves out there. So definitely push yourselves out of your comfort zone if you can. Joshua. Well, mine is like completely different and I'm gonna try to do two in one. So one is don't stress this year, enjoy your last year, 
Um, don't get really caught to up like, yes, am I getting in? I'm not, you're going to go somewhere that you will be able to thrive no matter what. So don't worry about it. Enjoy your time. Have fun with the process. But on the other half, apply the scholarships now. Like, don't wait till this time next year when you're looking at your financial aid package. Start now <laughs> so you don't have to stress next year at this time. Absolutely. And Joshua, you have a question in the Q&A if you want to get to that before we click off. And Kylie, bring us home. All right, well, I definitely echo everything that you guys said 100%. Um, my biggest piece of advice is to lean on your resources. You are all coming from schools with phenomenal um, counseling offices. They know what they're doing, and so please use them. Um, they have your best interest at heart, and they're thinking about what's going to be a strong match or fit for you in types of institutions. I know it's very, very tempting to look at the ranking list um, and just start there, but I caution you against that. Um, please don't start there. Talk to people, um, and students are always the best resource, too. They, they're the ones who are actually in it, and they will be very honest with you, so reach out to them. Ask about their own experiences, um, but definitely, yeah, use your resources. Outstanding. Well, thank you everyone for that great advice and for sharing such good information tonight. Uh, as we wrap up, I just want to remind our participants that when you click out of this screen this evening, there will be a very short four question survey that will pop up. If you could take a second or two to respond to that survey, that will help us as we promote and as we um, send forth with more information for students in the future, maybe even you. Um, there And again, the recordings of all of the sessions from this evening's College Fair can be found at strivescan.com slash St. Louis for School. So we look forward to seeing you on our campuses and we wish you all the best in your college search. I'm Thanks so for sorry I didn't, I didn't get to the question. I accidentally oh. did answer live. So if Lana, if you yeah. could email me, I will definitely get back to you on that. Sorry about that. Fantastic. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Take care.